tēnā koutou katoa, nau mai haere mai ki te ake mātua o te ture, ko Jeff Shirtcliffe, taku ingoa, he kai komi hana hau. Welcome uh, everybody to uh, the Law Commission and our webinar on uh, adults with affected decision making. Uh, my name is Jeff Shirtcliffe, I'm the Commissioner here uh, leading this, uh, this project. To my right is our project lead, Megan Ray. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, or Megan Ray, tōku um, Hello everybody, uh, as Jeff said, my name is Megan, uh, and I'm a member of the team here at the Commission working on our review of adult decision-making capacity law. Um, so thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon, um, and we really hope you find this webinar informative. Um, before we get into things, um, I just want to address four brief housekeeping matters. Um, so the first thing to know is that uh, if you have any questions for us during the webinar, um, you can please feel free to use the Q&A function. Um, and this is a button that you should see at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. And you can click on that um, and type in a question. Uh, and those questions will be sent uh, just to our team. Um, so other attendees won't be able to see them. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll be able to see them and, and answer them at the end of this session. Um, just, um, just for your information, uh, if you have questions about how you can make a submission, um, we've got lots of information about that on our website, so that, that is uh, there for you. Um, because we have limited time today, we may not be able to get through everybody's questions, depending on how many we get. Um, so if we reach the end of the time and your question hasn't been answered, um, please feel free to send us an email or get in touch with your website and uh, we can answer your question directly. Um, and just on the Q&A function, um, just to note, we won't be using the other Zoom functionality uh, like raising hands. Um, so if you do have a question, make sure to click that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So the second housekeeping matter to cover today is uh, just to quickly let you know that we aren't able to offer legal advice or respond to questions about uh, individual circumstances. Um, if you need legal advice, um, you can contact uh, your local community law centre, uh, Citizens Advice Bureau, or you can use the Law Society's online uh, Find a Lawyer tool. Um, and again, all the details for those are on our website. Uh, third piece of uh, housekeeping is just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so if you miss something um, or if you have to rush off to do something, you can come back later. We'll post it on our website in a couple of days um, and then you can come back and look at it again, catch up on what you missed. And please, if you know someone who was hoping to get here but couldn't, let, do let them know that, um, that it will be available on our website probably from next week. Um, but, but on that, uh, your cameras and microphones are all switched off, so when the recording is put online, there won't be any identification of, of uh, anybody who attended the webinar other than us, obviously. Uh, lastly, um, look, we recognise that um, listening to discussion about people with affected decision making can be distressing or upsetting for some people and remind them of difficult times in their lives and uh, if if that's the case then you know you may want to have someone watch this webinar with you but also um, on our website there's uh, details of a number 1737 which you can text or call uh, that's a 24-hour um, seven day a week helpline with trained counsellors who you can talk to. It's run by Pakarongoro um, Aotearoa, the New Zealand Telehealth Services. And again, the details are, um, are on our project website. Megan. Oh, and uh, just to note as well, we'll be popping the information about those in the chat as well, so that is available to refer to. Um, so, now that we've covered a bit of housekeeping, we'll move on to uh, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so in today's webinar, we're going to cover five main topics. Uh, so we'll start by giving a brief overview of who Te Akamata Auditory the Law Commission is and what it is that we do. Uh, second, we'll tell you a bit more about what this review is about and uh, why we really want you to make a submission. 
the third thing we'll cover is explaining a bit about uh, what work we've done so far and uh, what we're doing in this consultation process. Uh, the fourth thing we'll cover is uh, we'll go through some of the main issues that uh, we cover in our issues paper and um, that we're asking for people's views on. Um, and the fifth and final thing we'll cover is talking about what happens after this consultation process finishes. Um, so, and then once we've gone through those five things, uh, we'll hopefully have some time to uh, answer questions at the end. Uh, so I'll hand back to Jeff to get us started. Thanks, Megan. Okay, so the first thing that Megan mentioned is who are we? So Te Akamatua Te Ture Law Commission uh, is an independent, we're an independent state sector agency and our primary role is to review areas of the law that the government asks us to review and to make recommendations for, for reform. Uh, we're different to a lot of state sector agencies in that we're independent. So the government asks us to review particular areas of law, but it doesn't tell us what the outcome should be, what policies uh, it wants to see um, us recommend. It doesn't uh, instruct us how we do our work. So we have a very open slate and what we, what we do is we approach every project with an open mind. Um, and every project is different, but uh, the common things are we do a lot of research in New Zealand and overseas of uh, relevant law and often practice. Um, we consult uh, with the public and with um, key stakeholders. Um, and we typically do that by publishing one or more issues papers, such as we've already done for this project and asking for submissions. Um, and then ultimately we prepare a report and we deliver that to the minister responsible for the law commission who's currently the minister of justice uh, it gets laid before parliament and then it's up to the government to um, say whether or not it agrees with our recommendations and and if so uh, whether it's going to be on the legislative agenda anytime soon um, so we don't, and we don't have a say in that. Our job is to make the recommendations. Uh, but to do that, um, it's really important for us to hear from people that have experience of the laws that we're reviewing. Uh, you know, good law uh, has to be law that works for the people who are subject to that law, who interact with that law. So processes like this are an incredibly important part of, of our reviews. Um, so uh, let me thank you for showing interest and for tuning in and encourage you to uh, to make a submission for the 3rd of March. Megan. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, I'll now talk about the second thing uh, we're going to cover in the uh, webinar today, which is uh, what is this review about? So we are reviewing the law and practice relating to adult decision-making capacity. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, we are considering how the law should respond uh, when an adult's decision-making is affected. Um, and a person's decision-making can be affected by a really wide range of things. Um, this can include dementia, learning disabilities, uh, experiences of mental distress, uh, acquired brain injuries, um, just to name a few. Um, under the current law, uh, if an adult's decision making is affected, the law may treat their decisions differently to how um, they would otherwise. Um, this is based on a concept of uh, decision making capacity. And if a person is assessed not to have decision making capacity, uh, their decision might not have legal effect. Uh, another person might be appointed to make a decision for them. Uh, and some of the ways that that can happen is through uh, mechanisms like welfare guardians, property managers, uh, attorneys pointed under an enduring power of attorney. Um, another situation might be that a person has an advanced directive that gets activated if they're assessed to uh, have lost decision making capacity. Um, but there's a lot of different mechanisms that can uh, be triggered when um, a person is assessed to have lost capacity. Uh, so the main law in this area is the uh, Protection of Personal and Property Rights Act, um, sometimes called the Triple PRA. Um, 
this act is the main focus of our review, um, but there are a, a really wide range of other laws uh, and legislation in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, which uh, touch on decision-making capacity in some way or involve decision-making capacity. Uh, so we'll be taking a broad look across the statute book um, to look at how those, whether those laws need to be um, amended. Um, so why are we doing this review? Well, over um, recent years, um, there have been uh, calls from a, a range of sectors uh, for the law relating to adult decision-making capacity to be reviewed uh, to make sure that it works well for the people uh, people who have affected decision-making and for those around them. Um, some of those reasons are uh, the greater focus on, uh, on protection of human rights, uh, particularly for disabled people, uh, such as the United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, there's also the increasing recognition that our law does not reflect te ao Māori, uh, tikanga or te tiriti or waitangi. Uh, our understanding of what it means to have decision-making capacity and what that concept entails is, is also evolving. Um, our population is changing, uh, we're becoming more diverse as a nation and, and we're also living longer. Um, and finally there, you know, the law is 40, uh, the PRA for example is 40 years old, so there's a range of uh, practical uh, issues with the law that need fixing. Uh, and for all of these reasons, uh, the, um, the Minister for Justice has therefore asked us to carry out a review um, to make recommendations about how the law relating to adult decision making capacity can be improved. Uh, there's a bit more detail on uh, the scope of our review and the key things we're touching on in our terms of reference. Um, the terms of reference are quite long here on our website, so you can go and, and, and read through them all there. Um, just a key thing to perhaps frame the rest of the discussion um, in this webinar, a key thing that our terms of reference indicate we'll look at is how the law should strike the right balance between, on the one hand, um, allowing and enabling um, and empowering people to make decisions about their own lives, including with support from a whanau, family and, and carers. Uh, and on the other hand, keeping people safe from harm. So a key focus for us is, is how the law can strike the right balance between those two things in all the myriad of circumstances in which people with affected decision-making um, have decisions to make. Uh, so we've covered who the Law Commission is and what this review is about. Uh, so we'll now uh, cover the third topic uh, on the agenda for this webinar, uh, which is about our process. So what have we done so far um, and what are we doing in this consultation period? Uh, so on what we've done so far, um, our terms of reference uh, for this review, which Jeff uh, just mentioned, were published in October 2021. Uh, since then, uh, we've been focusing on carrying out research to underpin uh, our review. So looking at things like issues with the current law um, and also looking at what's happening overseas and researching developments in other countries. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time thinking about public engagement. Um, we know that the laws in this area affect a huge range of, uh, of people and can have a massive impact on people's lives. Um, so we really want to hear from people about how the law can be improved. Um, so we've spent quite a lot of time planning and consulting with relevant organisations and individuals um, about how we can make our engagement process uh, as accessible and easy to participate in as possible. Uh, we've also established two expert advisory groups uh, to help guide us throughout our review. Um, so the first of those groups is a, a lived experience group, so people with personal lived experience of the law and practice in this area, um, along with uh, whānau members and caregivers. Um, and our second expert group is a uh, professionals group, and that uh, is made up of a range of lawyers, uh, academics and medical professionals. Uh, and we've also held a wānanga with experts in te ao Māori and te Māori. Uh, so 
I'll talk a little bit now about the consultation process, which this webinar is, is part of. Um, in November, the end of November last year, we published our preliminary issues uh, paper. Um, and that provides some high level information about current law and practice um, and asks 20 questions, which are focused on people's experiences of the current law and current practice. Um, the main goal with the preliminary issues paper um, and with this round of consultation is to hear about people's lived experiences. As I said before, a good law has to be responsive to people's on the ground experiences and the reality of their lives. And so that's where we want to start um, with, with this consultation process. Um, and with that in mind, we've, we've tried to write the issues paper in a very accessible way. Um, we've stepped clear of legal language. It's not directed principally at lawyers or other professionals. It's, it's directed at everybody. Um, and we've also included a summary, a 12 page summary for people who aren't in a position to read the full 70 pages of the, the issues paper. Um, and that summary is also available um, in a number of other of formats, Te Reo Māori, uh, Braille format, audio format, New Zealand sign language format, um, and large font uh, format. All of those uh, are available on our website. Um, importantly, though, if you look at the summary, you won't miss out on any of the questions in the preliminary issues paper. The summary asks exactly the same questions and has the same core information as the preliminary issues paper. The issues paper just goes into a bit more detail. So don't feel that you have to uh, work through the, the issues paper if you don't have time. Uh, or aren't in a position to do that. Um, Megan. Uh, so now that we've talked a bit about uh, the process for this review, uh, we'll now move on to the fourth topic that uh, we want to cover today. Um, and that's just to um, go through some of the uh, key areas uh, that we cover in our issues paper. Um, so we thought that rather than spending this webinar going through it in section by section, uh, we thought we would just give you a bit of an overview of the sorts of things that we're asking about uh, in this consultation. Um, and you may well be familiar with some of these issues or topics already. Um, so the first one, um, just to note, is uh, we asked some questions about language. Uh, in the paper, we talk about the kind of language that we're proposing uh, to use in the review. Uh, particularly when we're talking about different people or groups who are affected by the law in this area. Uh, for example, uh, language relating to disabled persons and uh, to people experiencing mental distress. Um, and we've asked about this because we know that language is really important to people um, and people have often quite strong views or preferences about the language uh, that they use to refer to themselves. Um, so it was important to us to seek public feedback on, on some of the terminology that we use uh, in the review. Uh, another important topic that we discuss in the issues paper is uh, and ask questions about is uh, understandings of decision making in Te Ao Māori. Uh, for example, we discuss uh, a set of tikanga principles that were identified um, at uh, Wānanga we held uh, last year. And we asked some questions about whether people think these are the most relevant uh, tikanga principles and concepts um, that we should be considering in our review. Um, we really want to hear from people about uh, whether the law currently makes uh, enough space for um, Māori to act in accordance with tikanga uh, as, they, as they would like to when decision making is affected in some way. Um, and how the law could be uh, improved to more fully reflect our Māori understandings of decision making. Uh, a third topic that we uh, are seeking feedback on in the paper is uh, the guiding principles that we will use in our review. Um, so we tend to use guiding principles in all of our projects um, to 
uh, help us identify the important values and objectives uh, that need to be considered um, in a particular law reform area. Uh, so for this review, we've, we've set out seven proposed guiding principles uh, that we'll use to guide us in our work. Um, and we're looking for public feedback on whether we've got those right. Um, we also spend some time in the issues paper talking about the different ways that other people can be involved in someone's decision making. Um, so some of those ways are already provided for in the law, things like enduring powers of attorney and welfare guardian arrangements um, and also advanced directives. And so we ask some questions about people's experiences with those uh, type of arrangement. Uh, some of them aren't uh, reflected in the current law, in particular, uh, the idea of collective decision making. And so we're very interested in people's views on whether they think the law could better reflect decision making, which involves a number of people all contributing to the process of making the decision. Uh, and of course, we're very interested in supported decision making, which is not something the law um, really goes out of its way to recognise, but is still practised in a lot of by a lot of people, and it's part of um, an increasing there's increasing focus around the world and in New Zealand. Uh, about supported decision making. So we ask questions about people's experience with supported decision making. Um, a fourth topic that we also address is what should happen when decision making arrangements don't work well. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, um, a key focus for us in this review is trying to identify how the law can strike the right balance between enabling people to make decisions about their own lives with support and safeguarding people from harm. And so we're very interested in people's experiences with whether existing protective mechanisms and safeguards have worked, what other work, what other safeguards might work. Um, it's quite difficult to ask those questions um, in isolation from particular arrangements. So We've, we've included some short scenarios uh, in the issues paper and we've asked questions about those particular scenarios uh, because it's important that the law has appropriate safeguards and um, has appropriate ways to ensure that people do what they're supposed to do, that people are held accountable. Um, we also um, ask about anything else that people think we should know about. I mean, it's a relatively short issues paper and we're very conscious that it's pitched at a quite high level. Um, and we don't want um, people to think that there are important things that we should know about which we haven't asked questions about. So this very open-ended question in there it's about anything else that people think we should be aware of as we continue our work. Uh, and then finally, we also ask questions about our process. Um, this is the first of two planned rounds of consultation and so if there are learnings that we can take from this round to uh, improve our next round of consultation then we're keen to to, to do that absolutely so uh, we've reached the final topic for this webinar uh, which is what happens after this consultation period finishes uh, and uh, the closing date for this for this round of consultation and submissions is uh, the 3rd of March 2023. Uh, so once consultation has closed, uh, the feedback that we uh, receive and the submissions on the issues paper uh, will use those to help us develop options um, for how the law might be uh, reformed. So we'll be analysing all the feedback we receive um, and uh, using that to develop some options and then we will be running a second round of public consultation uh, in the second half of 2023. Uh, so this second uh, round of consultation will be uh, supported by a probably longer consultation document um, and that will uh, step through and outline the current law and issues uh, in a bit more detail um, and it will outline some options for reform that we will then um, seek public feedback on. Um, and after that second round of consultation has concluded, uh, we'll then uh, prepare our final report. 
and uh, this will make recommendations to the government uh, based on uh, our work and what the public has told us uh, on how the law should be reformed in this area. And we are aiming to provide our final report to the Minister uh, by the 30th of June 2024. Okay, so uh, we've got time for some questions which have come in. Um, uh, a few of these came in by email ahead of, of, the, um, of the webinar. Um, and I see uh, one question has already come in and you may have more, um, in which case, please feel free to fire them in via the, the chat function. Um, the first question which, which came in earlier um, was interested in how retroactivity of decision-making capacity might be addressed. Um, I, I assume that, that what this is getting at is how a law should respond when after a decision has been made, someone suggests that that decision wasn't properly taken because the person who made it didn't have um, adequate decision making capacity. Um, so assuming for the purpose of the question that the concept of capacity is retained in the law um, in something like its current way, then clearly the law needs to address um, what should happen if there's a suggestion that a decision which was previously taken um, should be looked at again because the person didn't have capacity. So yes, that's absolutely one of the things we're looking at. Um, can't tell you what we're going to conclude yet because we haven't got to that part of the review, but we are definitely looking at that type of, of issue. Yes, and I think we'd really welcome um, submissions uh, on on that point. Uh, if yeah. people have experienced that situation or have uh, thoughts about how the law could be improved in that in that situation, yeah. then uh, yes, please get in touch. Uh, so we have received a couple of questions about um, meeting uh, with particular groups during this consultation period, um, and uh, our, our ability to come and come and meet with people. Um, and I think that just reflects that the issues that we're considering in this review affects a huge number of uh, New Zealanders in a really wide range of situations. And there's lots of people and groups with a really strong interest in, in this review. Um, we're a small team of uh, five uh, working at the Commission on this review, um, balancing doing our um, doing the engagement alongside our research and policy work. Um, and unfortunately, this means that we simply don't have the resources to meet with everyone um, as much as we would like to. Um, however, we really encourage you to make a submission, um, whether that's on your own behalf, on behalf of an organisation, uh, or even bringing people together, you uh, bringing together people that you know with an interest to make a joint submission. Um, we'd, we'd really, really love to hear from you. And if there are particular questions or, or matters that you need to if you'd like to clarify to get some more information to help you make a submission, um, then our contact details are on the website and you can get in touch with us and we'll, we'll do our best to help. Um, we had an, another question about what safeguards can be put in place about challenging and enduring power of attorney. Um, I think what, what the questioner is particularly interested in there is, is um, what should the law do where if, if someone who has an enduring power of attorney is being ignored um, or a, a, th a third party wants to challenge the decisions of that attorney. Um, and that is also clearly something that we need to look at. Again, as I said before, what we're trying to do is find the right balance for the law between enabling people to make decisions about their own lives. And that includes by way of uh, an enduring power of attorney uh, and protecting people from harm. And so clearly if someone has uh, made uh, someone else their attorney, um, that the person who, who appointed the attorney will want the attorney's um, uh, decisions to, to be followed. That's the purposes of the enduring power of attorney. On the other hand, the law needs to make sure that the person who was appointed the attorney um, does what they're supposed to do. Um, so there need to be checks and balances. Um, 
and <clears throat> all enduring power of attorney situations are different. Everybody's individual situation is different. So our task is to find how the law should strike the right balance between those two things in all cases. Um, and so we're certainly looking at that. And again, um, if the person who asked the question and, and or anybody else has suggestions, then we're very keen to hear from them. So please do make a submission, even if you only make a submission on, on that point or a few points of interest to you, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one of the other questions we had in uh, was uh, about supported decision making. Um, so uh, and how this can be uh, more fully implemented in, in New Zealand. Um, and uh, the person you said in the question said that New Zealand has, um, has some progress to make here um, and that it's really important to take into account uh, Titility or Waitangi um, and also just observed uh, the opportunity uh, that exists right now to do, um, to take uh, human rights and a Titility approach and really take that forward uh, in New Zealand. Um, and I think that's, that is, we agree. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, that question of how New Zealand can make process uh, progress in embedding uh, supported making supported decision making in the law and practice in this area um, is really important, as Jeff signalled. Um, lots of people are doing this um, in their um, in their own lives, um, but it's really important to think about how the law um, and practice can be um, developed to to more fully enable that. Um, and I think we really have an opportunity to explore what that can look like um, in a New Zealand context and how that can align with Tutility or Waitangi and, and our Māori centric approaches. Um, so as with other topics, uh, we really welcome uh, submissions on that point um, and what you think supported decision making in New Zealand um, could look like and, and in particular what that could look like in a uh, Tutility centric um, approach. Um, there's also a question come in that says, will a change of government in October 2023 stop this process? Um, well, look, we, we, we obviously um, can't predict what uh, any government will do, but uh, there's absolutely no reason that we're aware of to, to think that um, whoever is the government after the next election will, will want to stop this, this review that we've got. No indication of that, um, and I don't think that law commissions projects generally or ever um, uh, have been changed because of a change of government. So we are proceeding on the basis um, that we're delivering a report um, uh, by the 30th of June 2024, and I fully expect that that will continue to be the case. I think that's the last of the questions which have come in and a, a couple of you have made some comments so um, thank you for those those comments um, which we'll take on board um, but I don't think any more questions have come in. Um, so we've been remarkably efficient and we are done 10 minutes ahead of time um, so we won't we won't drag it out. Um, let me though, before we go, just offer a couple of thanks. The first is to Kelly and Scott, uh, New Zealand Sign Language Interpreters. Um, thank you very much for doing what you do. I have no idea how you do it, but we're very happy to have you here. Um, and secondly, uh, thank you to all of you who've tuned in um, on what I hope for you is a sunny, afternoon like it is for us here in, in Wellington. Um, we hope this has been helpful um, and we very much look forward to, to your submissions. Um, so thank you for showing interest um, and joining us in this webinar. Um, just a couple of, of things, uh, a reminder that uh, you can go to capacity.lawcom.govt.nz um, to access our preliminary issues paper and the summary in accessible formats and there's also some FAQs there and uh, other information about the process. 
um, including the little um, video, uh, animated video advertising um, this review. Um, feel free to share that with anybody you know who may be, be interested. Um, submissions, as Megan said, are open till the 3rd of March. So we, we very much hope that sometime between now and then you get a chance to put a pen to paper, um, as it were, and, uh, and send us a submission. And as Megan mentioned, you can do that online. Um, so we tried to make it as easy as possible for people to submit by um, uh, answering the questions that you want to answer just online through our, our website. So look, I hope that this has been helpful for you. Um, oh, one more question, it's a good one. Your website refers to a previous webinar. Did that have different content or is this a repeat? Good question. Um, the content was largely the same except for the questions. So there were a few questions last time which were different to these ones. So if you're interested in seeing those questions, you can skip forward through most of the last website um, webinar until you get to until you get to, uh, to the questions. Good question. Thank you. Um, right. So I hope that's been helpful. Thank you very much for tuning in. We look forward to hearing from you, reading your submissions. Um, I mean, no, you can't